In this section, we're going to talk about payment. There's a lot more to payment than you might think, and it's always a contentious issue on construction projects. Payment is one of the key responsibilities of the principal. They need to ensure they're paying the contractor for the works completed. Payment is always such an important issue when administrating any contract for a couple of reasons. Firstly, payment is a powerful motivator, meaning withholding and delaying payment is often used as a negotiating tactic, or ensuring payment is made only when works are completed can be a way of ensuring contractors complete their scopes. Another important concept to understand, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about payment terms, is the time value of money. Usually there are delays from when works are completed to when contractors receive payment. This requires contractors to make upfront payments before receiving payment from the principal. This time gap leads to them having to borrow money from the bank at higher interest rates, meaning there is a real cost to delayed payment. And finally, completed works and unpaid bills are a form of security. When a principal pays for something, effectively, they're agreeing that the works have been completed. Again, we'll talk more about this later. The payment terms in the contract are there to ensure there is a clear and transparent process for how the contractor is to receive payment. It will define the payment mechanism in the contract the process for making payment claims, and the specific conditions. The payment mechanism in the contract is the process by which the contractor gets paid. There are multiple different payment mechanisms depending on the form of contract. To make things more confusing, the same contract can use multiple different payment mechanisms for different scopes. The four types of payment mechanisms we encounter are fixed costs, where a fixed fee is paid for the delivery of a complete scope of works. During procurement, a contractor will quote a scope of works, then deliver it. Schedule of rates are similar to fixed-fee contracts, but the quantum of work is variable. Contractors will quote a unit rate, for example a price per lineal metre of subsurface drainage supplied and installed. The contractor will then be paid based on how many lineal metres they install. Cost reimbursable is where the contractor paid the actual cost of the work completed, plus an agreed-upon profit margin. The contractor will need to provide evidence of the actual costs incurred, and the agreed-upon margin will be written into the contract. Under a target cost mechanism, also known as a pain-gain share model, are typically used in alliance and relationship-based contracts. The project costs are agreed during the development stage and any over- or underspending of the budget is shared between the parties. Multiple different payment mechanisms will likely be used in the one contract. Fixed cost pricing is used when the scope is known up front and a fixed fee can be requested from a contractor. This will occur when contractors are quoting for works competitively before contract award or could be used to price variations during project delivery. For example, if we give a contractor additional scope and want lump sum pricing for it before the scope is undertaken. A schedule of rates contract is used when the activities are known but the exact quantum of work is unclear. For example, maybe we know we need a subcontractor to supply and install 450 diameter concrete pipe but we don't know how many lineal metres we'll need. Works are delivered at cost plus when the scope is unclear, typically included as provisional sum items, so we can't request fixed cost pricing or for variations and delays that are retrospective. Say a contractor was waiting on site access from the principal, the contractor had four workers and a crane waiting for five hours. The contractor would be paid the actual costs of the plant and machinery delayed. Finally, target cost mechanisms are used almost exclusively in relationship-based contracts. Payment claims are made progressively as the contract works are completed. This makes sense when you think about it. Imagine a $5 million one-year contract. As the contractor, you wouldn't be happy to receive a lump sum in one year's time for the total value when all your labour, plant and material costs are paid weekly. Furthermore, what happens if the principal goes broke before you get paid? Payment claims occur monthly and the amount paid is the value of the works completed in accordance with the contract sum. The payment claim process first begins with the contractor submitting a payment claim to the principal. They'll fill out the pricing schedule with their assessment of how much work they have completed up till the end of that month. Payment claims typically need to be in before the 25th of each month. The principal will then assess this claim based on the works completed, any breaches of contract and any additional claims such as variations, extensions of time and so on. Generally speaking, payment will only be made for works that have been completed. Contractors tend to overclaim, so the principal will need to carefully verify how much work has actually been completed. At this stage, there is typically back and forth between the principal and contractor as they agree on what works have actually been completed. The principal also has a fixed time frame to respond to the claim, typically something like five working days. If the principal is delayed in responding, then the claim will automatically be approved. Once the value of the claim is agreed upon, a progress payment certificate will be issued.
If practical completion has not been achieved, then this process will repeat itself monthly. When practical completion does occur, the defect liability period will commence and part of the contractor's security will be returned. At the end of the defect's liability period, all security will be returned and a final payment claim can be made. This is to cover any outstanding works or variations not yet claimed. After this has been reviewed and approved, the contract will be closed out and no additional payment claims can be made. The contract will detail specifics around how claims are to be made and the terms of payment. The contract will specify the payment terms, which is the duration from when the principal issues the payment certificate to when the money will be sent to the contractor. Any security requirements such as bank guarantees or cash retention, which we'll cover later. Where the payment for any off-site goods is allowed, the date payment claims are to be made and the time frame for responding to claims. Finally, let's finish this section on payment by going through an example of a progress claim. This is an example payment claim from an imaginary street lighting subcontractor called Uproad Civil. Uproad Civil have been engaged to complete the civil and electrical works associated with a new street lighting system by us, the head contractor, on a road project. Let's first start by looking at the structure of the payment claim. You can see the payment claim is broken down into a couple of different sections. This payment claim template would come from the original pricing schedule submitted with Uproad Civil's tender response. The first section details the payment items and the scope awarded to the contractor at tender. The contract has two separable portions, separable portion A, the street lighting civil works, and separable portion B, the supply and installation of the electrical works. Under each separable portion, there are schedule of rate payment items. So for example, under separable portion A, there are payment items for trench types A, B, and C, light pole foundations, electrical pits, and distribution board foundations. We next have the unit under which each of these quantities are assessed. So for the trenches, these quantities are based on how many metres of trenches installed, while the foundations and pits are for each unit. Next is the contract unit rate price. So for each lineal metre of trench type A, Uproad Civil get paid $450. We also have the total quantity awarded at tender. So at the tender stage, it was assumed that the total quantity of work was 1,200 metres of trench type A. 29,800 metres of trench type B and 330 metres of trench type C, and so on. In a schedule of rate contract, these quantities are indicative only and they're primarily for the calculation of an indicative total contract value that is used for insurance and securities. Based on these quantities, we can see the total contract value for separable portion A and separable portion B is around $4 million. Next, under the green section, we have what was previously claimed and paid to the subcontractor for their December works. In December, we paid Uproad Civil $238,610. This was because we assessed they completed 193 metres of trench type A, 256 metres of trench type B, 43 metres of trench type C, 6 light pole foundations and 8 electrical pits, as well as an approved variation of $13,560. Now looking at the yellow section, we have what Uproad Civil is claiming for in January 2021. Remember, Uproad Civil need to claim for what they believe has been completed in the month. It is then our responsibility as the head contractor to review and assess this claim. Uproad Civil are claiming for the quantities shown, so 490 metres of trench type A, 980 metres of trench type B, and so on. You can see under separable portion B, they have also stood 28 light poles but have completed no other electrical works. They are also claiming two variations, variation B which they believe is worth $26,700 and variation C which is worth $4,320. This claim comes out at $1,106,020. Under the orange heading, we then have our assessment of this claim. As the head contractor or principal in this relationship, we need to assess this claim for what we believe it is worth. You can then see the quantities we have assessed it for under the orange column. While Uproad Civil are claiming for 490 metres of trench type A, we believe they have only completed 380 metres. Same with the distribution board foundations. They are claiming for two, and we believe they haven't completed any. The reason for this dispute is most likely that although they have substantially completed two, there may be some outstanding defects or works, and thus, we do not believe they are fully finished, so unwilling to pay them for it. In summary, our assessment of the claim only comes out at $1,008,820. I've attached a copy of this example claim to the course notes, but it should give you a pretty good indication of how claims and payment work.